Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, there we go. Just wanted to make sure this is all working okay. Super. Uh, and if someone could just give me control of the slides, that way I'll be able to scroll through. That'd be lovely. Uh, lovely, fantastic, brilliant. Uh, so today I'm here to discuss uh, a three-year study and other programmes of study which have been sponsored by AHDB Dairy and conducted at the University of Nottingham. Uh, a range of the data that I'm going to present to you today is preliminary, but very, very exciting nonetheless. Um, and I'll welcome questions throughout and I'll, I'll address those all at the end if that's okay. If we can have the next slide, please. So hopefully we all understand that lameness is a huge problem across the developed dairy sector within the UK or across the world, really, when we look at it. One in three cows are lame at any given time within our UK dairy herd, and that's actually fairly generalizable across the world. Let's just dwell on that for a second. One in three cows are lame at any given time. I, I can be quite doom and gloom about this, but I think it's rightfully so. A third of that pint of milk has come from a lame cow. Thinking about that, these are animals, these, these are um, sentient beings that experience pain and um, have welfare challenges associated with this lameness. We understand that the claw horn lesions, so if we look at these three pictures below working from left to right, we have white line disease, sole hemorrhage and sole ulceration, uh, highly prevalent and, and highly recurrent throughout our dairy herd and they're a predominant cause of lameness within the UK. In spite of all of this, there's a, there's a really poor in, investment in research historically. Um, part of that's due to um, associated pharmaceutical drug sales um, and there's other challenges in, in line with that. Um, but this is, this is a big challenge basically, facing our herd. This, all of this is, is a really substantial challenge. And this is also an opportunity now for us to um, try and take forward best practice, take forward the evidence base that we have and move forward within this world because it's amazing still um, the, how certain treatments are implemented or not on farm. If we have the next slide please. So our current understanding dictates that there's a huge range of inputs uh, associated with, with the development of claw horn disease. Anything from cow comfort, lying times, hoof confirmation, also other things like development and genetics. And we'll see some really exciting work coming from the University of Liverpool, particularly focused around the role of genetics in the development of claw horn lesions. But where my particular interest has come in is, is actually focusing on previous lameness. We understand that 80% of the risk of a case of lameness comes from a previous case of lameness. So those cows that become lame are much more likely to be lame for the rest of their lives. And understanding the mechanisms that drive this hopefully will allow us to break the chronicity cycle associated with lameness and claw horn disease uh, to, to begin to crack this prevalence of, of chronically lame animals that we see throughout the UK. If we could have the next slide, please. And understanding the mechanisms that drive forward initial lameness are really, really important as well. Um, so effectively, if we, if we work our way through this diagram, what we're trying to focus on is a black box. We, we want to avoid increased pressure on the corium. That's the layer of cells that's responsible for um, producing horn. If we increase pressure on the corium, lesions form is, is the fairly straightforward mechanism that we see going forward. So we're trying to avoid those two things, one leading to the other. Management can have a direct impact on that, that's the red box, whether that be to increase standing times and um, poor pressures through the feet, so um, overgrown feet, for example, can, can be a, a, a cause of this. Um, but also then through the loss of body condition score through appropriate, uh, inappropriate um, nutritional management of, of your dairy cows, not meeting the energy requirements associated with milk yield, you'll see body condition score loss, which precedes lameness. And it's a cyclical effect. Lameness can lead to body condition score loss, body condition score loss can lead to lameness. If we look at the very top, we now understand that calving has a substantial role to play within both increasing pressure on the corium, so um, to fit a calf out of where it normally fits out of, uh, there's a massening, massive slackening of, of all of the suspensory tissues and collagenous tissues throughout the cow. So those are what holds things together including within the foot and we see that immediately post calving there's a substantial risk period associated with an increased um, risk of claw horn disease and also calving a cow rise to peak milk yield we see body condition score loss fairly straightforward association but that body condition score loss leads to fat being mobilized from the digital cushion uh, which is the cylinders of fat which dissipate the concussive forces of foot strike which lead to an increased pressure on the corium historically it's been Pressure on the corium, lesions form, end of story. The work conducted by Ruben Newsom in the Nottingham group found that um, animals with a history of claw horn lesions, so if we look at the two pictures 
here was illustrated quite nicely. Animals with a history of claw horn lesions um, are much more likely to have prolific bony growth on the most caudal aspect or the heel aspect of P3, so that triangular bone suspended in the middle of the picture. Um, if you compare the two, those an that animal with a history of claw horn lesions is much more likely to have more claw horn lesions in the future due to that growth on the heel of that pedal bone. If you think about where that's growing, that's I can't sadly do my impression of a cow walking in a webinar, but um, that, that bony growth is exactly where we want to avoid it. It's on that initial point of foot strike, that heel area that goes into the digital cushion and we understand it may metabolize part of the digital cushion as well. And a new area of thinking is around systemic inflammation, around carbon, around transition period. And what impact does that have? What impact does that transition period inflammation have to play within this cyclical nature of lesions forming? Um, and, and anatomical or pathological change to, to anatomy as well. And we understand that this is a downward spiral that cows go through on a very regular basis. You see a cow with a sore so she'll have some degree of uh, pathological change to, to her anatomy. If we could have the next slide, please. So with all of this in mind, um, we conducted a three year long randomized controlled trial. A randomized controlled trial is one of the most robust means of testing an intervention. So you effectively control for anything outside of your study that could have an impact, whether that's things like seasonality or recruiting all of your heifers to one group and all of your preferred lactation cows to another, for example. Um, but we conducted a, a randomized controlled study, which is, is what um, many of the COVID vaccines have been developed on recently. We you recruited a single commercial unit in North Nottinghamshire. Uh, they're pushing around 11 and a half, 12,000 litres out of their cows over a 305 day yield, they're continuously housed, milked three times a day. Um, great farm, really good group to work with. Um, a good cup of tea as well, I have to say. Um, but we chose them partly due to the type of cow they had and the facilities that they had, but also due to the high levels of data recording and good controls of the digital dermatitis that were present on the farm. Um, so, the main reason why it's a convenient sample as well as anything else. We recruited all of the heifers. I'm going to specifically talk about the heifers that we recruited now rather than the adult cows, although we do have data on those animals as well. All of the heifers were recruited and randomized to one of four treatment groups based on their expected carbon date. Uh, recruitment lasted for lifetime. So once that animal was in a group, let's say group one, which I'll talk to in a moment, they were in that group for the rest of their life until they were culled or withdrawn for management purposes, but that was exceptionally rare when that happened. I'm going to whistle through the treatment groups now. I appreciate that um, this is a very rapid way of doing it, but this table describing them is on the rest of the slides as a refresher for you all, and I'll happily go through them again at any point through the presentation. So our treatment group one cows, whenever they were identified as lame, they would receive a therapeutic trim, five, Dutch five-step trim, or a, a functional five-step trim, and an orthopedic block if required. Our animals in group two would receive exactly the same as group one in terms of the trim and the block, but they would also receive three days of the anti-inflammatory ketoprofen, and that would begin on the day of treatment at an appropriate dose rate for the product we were using. Treatment group three would receive exactly the same lameness treatments as treatment group two, but they would receive three days of ketoprofen, which began 24 hours after they carved, at first and subsequent carvings. Okay. Again, at an appropriate dose rate for the product we were using. Our group four cows would just receive three days of ketoprofen when they were identified as lame. That being said, if they were identified as severely lame, we would intervene with the trim and a block. The point of this study was not to have cows hobbling around lame. Um, we, we did this in quite a controlled manner, and the farmer had a degree of autonomy still in, in, in decision making push side around their cows. If we could have the next slide, please. Our treatment protocols followed what's called the EDPET principle, and this is something which Dr. Nick Bell is a big advocate for. The EDPET stands for Early Detection and Prompt Effective Treatment. Our mission here was to pick out early signs of lameness. We weren't looking to pull out wall ulcers, chronic digital dermatitis, horrendous issues facing these cows. We were looking to intervene at the earliest point because we understand it's at the earliest point of lameness where you're likely to see the most benefit. So we're following the evidence base with our treatment protocol. All of the lameness scoring was conducted on a fortnightly basis, normally on a Sunday or a Monday. And then in the subsequent two to three days, all lame animals identified within the herd would be treated. 
according to their protocol. Again, with these animals, we were intervening early and intervening as quickly as possible. It's important to note, so our scoring was quite harsh and refined within this. Our butchering protocol followed the Dutch five-step method or the functional five-step method as it's now being, being called, with two adaptations, a slightly longer toe length and a slightly wider and deeper model. Both of those have a fairly robust evidence base behind them. When we identified an animal as lame, we'd pick up the lame limb and the contralateral limb. So if the cow was lame on our front left foot, we'd pick up the front right foot as well and administer the same treatments and the same for the back feet. So once we've finished all these treatments, in my mind, I'm the best lameness scorer, I'm the best foot trimmer. And subconscious bias is such a strong thing. So we wound up recruiting two independent lameness scorers who would come in on a fortnightly basis, typically on the Friday to the Friday following the Friday following, if that makes sense, the two weeks after we'd been in to treat the animals. And they would come in and score the whole milking herd. I know nothing about the study. They'd occasionally get the odd cup of tea, if you could call that bribery. Um, but that was our outcome score. Really, really important piece of data because it's, it shouldn't, in theory, be confounded by any form of subjective bias, of subconscious bias. So these guys have no idea what we were doing to each of these animals on a fortnightly basis. And this is our outcome for the data that I'm going to present to you going forward. If we could have the next slide, please. So we collected all of this data, uh, a vast data set. The numbers are at the bottom. <laughs> it, it hopefully it highlights the body of work that this is. And we constructed several, um, several models, a model focused around uh, the risk of an animal being culled at any point throughout the study, and then two other models, logistic regression models. Um, one was focused on the risk of an animal being scored as a two or three throughout the study period. And the other one was an animal just being scored as a, a lameness score three throughout the study period. So these outcome scores are all blinded and are the result of three years of, of hard graph. If we can have the next slide, please. What we identified first and foremost within our treatment group three animals um, was vast. And now I really want to highlight the difference between treatment group one and treatment group three. Across many farms throughout the UK, um, treatment group one is probably the most common protocol that we would see. So that's an animal receiving a trim in a block uh, at lameness, no anti-inflammatory or pain relief or anything like that. Treatment group three is our maximum intervention if we describe it like that. So anti-inflammatory at lameness and trim and block, um, and anti-inflammatory when they carved in. So we call it a carving treatment group for, for argument's sake. And the difference between group one and group three was substantial in terms of a reduced risk of animals being culled at any point throughout the study period. This represents around 20 animals fewer being culled between treatment group one, uh, treatment group three and treatment group one. The animals were surviving for much, much longer within treatment group three. If we could have the next slide, please. Animals in treatment group three were also at a substantially and significantly reduced risk of being scored as score two or score three lane. So if we focus on the red line and the light blue line, those animals within treatment group three represented by the blue line and red group one, throughout the entire study period pretty much, animals within treatment group three with significantly reduced risk of being scored two or three lame. You can look at the green line for treatment group two, um, but actually this, this graph doesn't represent our confidence intervals, so we weren't, um, we weren't able to explain as much variation within treatment group two. So there's no statistically significant difference between treatment groups one and two, although within this graph visually it appears. So. But what I want to highlight within this graph is the difference between the blue and the red lines represents an absolute reduction of 10% in lameness prevalence. So this herd did, so um, it, it, the difference in, in treatment group one, if they ran through their protocol as per, they were at let's say 33% uh, lameness throughout that study period. We'd expect treatment group three to be at 23% lameness prevalence throughout that study period. So it is a substantial reduction in, in lameness uh, throughout the entire study duration as well. If we could have the next slide, please. If we then look at severe lameness, and bear in mind this is what the public see most, most commonly, that these cows that are hopping lame and really struggling to walk. Um, animals within treatment group one at the end of the study period were at a 4% chance of being scored as severely lame. Animals within group uh, within treatment group three were at a 1% risk of being scored as severely lame. So again, a substantial effect size there and trying to explain it's a, a very interesting part of our future work. If we could have the next slide, please. So the next data set I'm going to whistle through is for our adult cows. 
um, exactly the same models, exactly the same information, um, but I'm going to go through it quite quickly. If we can have the next slide, please. Because what we observed was absolutely no risk reduction at all in either lameness prevalence or in risk of culling. And this is with us intervening very early stage lameness. So to, it appears to get any benefit whatsoever, we need to intervene in our heifers. We need to intervene early with our heifers as well and with that calming treatment particularly. The one thing I will highlight with these adult cows is it appears that receiving a, a therapeutic trim, so groups one, two, and three, um, was really important in terms of reducing lameness prevalence. So these animals receiving a, a trim and a block is really important in, in managing their lameness story. And I don't want to diminish the importance of routine pain relief. If an animal is lame, she is in pain, and she requires some kind of pain relief. Okay. But in terms of reducing the risk of that animal being cold or scored as lame in the future, very, very minimal, if any, effect. well, we, we observe no effect, basically, between any of those treatment groups. If we go to the next slide, please. So what's interesting now is, is just starting to ask some questions around pain and pathology. What is it that we're actually managing? Are we managing this pain management cycle? So animals can experience pain and we have appropriate pain management that stops or we see inappropriate pain management wherein neural signaling pathways change and the nociceptive threshold or the pain threshold of the animals reduce. Are we intervening there or are we intervening in the, the um, pathogenic mechanisms? So that, that other graph that we were, the other chart we were describing earlier with um, lesions forming, inflammation, further lesions forming, anatomical change, all of these things. Which of these are we intervening in? I, I'd probably argue we're intervening in both, which is a good thing. Um, but we don't have any evidence for that, so trying to draw that out in the future is going to be really exciting. Our treatment group three, either way, whatever mechanism it works through, has seen us um, observe a, re a substantially reduced risk of an animal being scored as lame or slaughtered through the study period. Okay. And does that risk of them being um, reduced risk of them being slaughtered correlate directly to the reduced risk of lameness, or is, are there other parts around reducing that transition period inflammation? That we don't quite understand yet. But either way, carving appears to be a key risk, and we must intervene within our heifers and intervene early to make this work. If we can have the next slide, please. Um, many people to thank all listed up on this slide. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd more than welcome them, and please feel free to get in touch with me independently as well um, if, if you'd like to find out any more about this work. Hopefully, we'll be published uh, within the next few months, and, and I'll happily send that out to any interested parties as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Uh, we appear to have uh, mislaid our chairman for this session. Ah, Derek, can you um, see and hear? Yes, thank you, Shirley. Can you hear me? Good, thank you. Yes, please carry on. Thank you very much, James. It's some really exciting work there and some really valuable results. And I'm sure there'll be some good questions for you in the questions afterwards. Please remember to put your questions in the questions box um, and Shirley will um, put those to the speakers at the end of the session. Our next speaker is also from uh, the University, you know, it's from the University of Liverpool. It's Bethany Griffiths, and she's going to talk to us about um, non-infectious lameness causing lesions and bringing together current theories. So um, great that you could join us this afternoon, Bethany, and over to you. Good afternoon. Okay, so yeah, so I'm today talking about lesions causing non-infectious lameness and bringing together current theories. Uh, next slide. Hopefully. Yeah, perfect. So just a sort of brief introduction as to what uh, I'll sort of mainly be discussing. Um, so when we're talking about lameness causing lesions, these can be split into both infectious and non-infectious. So your infectious will be your things like your digital dermatitis, your foul, that sort of thing. And then your non-infectious will be things like your soul ulcers, soul hemorrhage, white line disease. These are also known as claw horn disruption lesions, and so that's the topic of my PhD. Uh, currently, there are several theories as to what is important in the development of these lesions. Uh, things like James has kind of already alluded to, so things like the carving effect, inflammation, hormones, genetics, housing environmental risk factors. There's definitely some literature there. Uh, the main, what I will be presenting today, will be looking more at the digital cushion and or also known as the fat pad you may have heard it called the fat pad um or soul soft tissue thickness they're all the same thing essentially so that fat pad um is a structure that sits underneath the pedal bone and it acts or we think it acts like a sort of cushioning structure 
um, as the cow walks. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so the overall objective of my study is to bring together all those current all those current sort of theories as to what causes claw horn disruption lesions and to test it in a single cohort of cows. Um, we've got 2,353 cows enrolled in the study across four farms, and we'll follow them across the entire sort of lactation. Um, so yeah, next slide. And how we've done that. So we'll enroll these cows at pre-calving um, and then we'll see them again at calving, freshly calved, early lactation and late lactation. And at each of those time points, we'll record um, a vast array of data. So things like mobility score, body condition score, thermography images um, will be taken of all feet. We'll assess all four feet for any lesions and um, have them graded for severity. We'll also take an ultrasound image of the digital cushion or the fat pad uh, and, that, um, and those animals will be blood sampled. We'll also grab uh, some farm records to check for health and production information. Uh, next slide. Okay, so as I sort of said before, we've enrolled 2,353 Holstein Frisian cows and heifers. Um, from that, we'll, we've got just shy of 15,000 thermographic images. You can see in sort of an example image of a thermographic image there, and um, just shy of 8,000 ultrasound images of the digital cushion. Uh, which you can see below there. So that's a that is an example of sort of the ultrasound image that we'd be taking on farm, and that bottom line there would correspond to the pedal bone. Uh, then you'll have uh, slightly higher up. Yep, that line there. So that will be the pedal bone there, and then the next sort of thick, bright white line, that one there, that's the interface between the um, the sole horn and the underlying soft tissues or your fat pad so that bit between the pedal bone and that bright white line you can see actually a yellow line that goes between it that would be an example of of the of the measurement that we take that corresponds to the fat pad and then the next sort of section up would be sole horn and then we have the outside world so we've also grabbed um genome wide genotypes for all of these animals, and we've also got biopsy samples from the suspensory apparatus of selected cows to further examine the functional genomics of these animals. And actually, these samples have been already been transferred down to the Royal Veterinary College, uh, who are our partners um, in this research uh, with the SRUC as well uh, for further analysis. Next slide. Okay, so as I kind of alluded to before, we're Although we've got this massive data set that we're collecting, at the moment, um, what I'm presenting to you today is just sort of a first look at a small section of that data set, and that's the, the fat pad data set that we've collected. And as you can see, we've got another example um, of what the digital cushion image looks like, and just so that you can kind of get an idea of actually what we're measuring. And what we've, what we've sort of shown is that when you look at the fat pad, uh, the fat pad by parity, that those first lactation animals animals have a significantly thinner fat pad compared to their older herd mates. Now that um, that's just that that finding it's not novel. Um, previous studies have already shown this, but what we've done is we've been able to confirm this on a much larger data set, so we can be a lot more confident actually that these first lactation animals definitely do have a thinner digital uh, a thinner fat pad. Um, and then to the right, we've got another graph. Uh, that graph is looking at how that fat pad changes over time um, through the stages of lactation. And what you can see here is that those animals have a significant thinning of the, of the fat pad um, at freshly calved. So around calving, that, that fat pad thins before then it increases. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so then this graph here, we've sort of, so we've got stage of lactation, we're looking at the fat pad again and how that changes over time. Um, but this time we've separated it out by farm. And what we've shown here is that um, those, that there is a bit of a farm effect. So how that fat pad changes over time is slightly different um, depending on farm. And we're not entirely sure at this point, having only had a quick look at the, at the, at the fat pad, data why this could be it could be a nutritional difference it could be an environmental difference we, we're not entirely sure yet but we're hoping that when we've got the full data set together that we'll really be able to sort of drill down um, into into why there is that, that interesting effect there next slide 
Okay, so then um, moving a little bit on from that, we then looked at how parity and stage of lactation sort of interacts with each other. So what you can see here is that, again, how the fat pad changes over time and out over the course of the lactation. Um, and you can, you can clearly see that first lactation animals have that significantly thinner digital, uh, that significantly thinner fat pad. And that fat pad is still growing. It's still, it, it, it's still developing and it, it's, it's sort of, it's still growing as that late that lactation is, is occurring um, compared to their second and third lactation animals who are, what, which are significantly higher. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this one, this one's an interesting one. Again, these are preliminary results, um, so are subject to some change. Um, but I'm quite excited about this. So when you look at, this is a graph that, that's again showing the fat pad over time. Um, we've separated out by lactation. So you've got your first, your first lactation animals, your heifers on, on the left there, and then your second and third lactation animals. And what we've done is we've separated them out as to whether they've developed a sole ulcer or early lactation um, on the back left, but where we measured or um, whether they didn't develop a sole ulcer. And you can see that, especially in those first and second lactation animals, there's a trend for animals that develop a, develop a sole ulcer at early lactation having a, 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 thinner, um, a, a thinner digital cushion or a thinner fat pad at, um, at calving compared to those animals that don't. Uh, now this is important, especially with the first lactation animals, James has already alert, um, alluded to it, so we're particularly interested in those heifers compared to their older herd mates, because this will be the first time that they'll have developed a sole ulcer, it'll be the first time they're going through these changes, there won't be any chronic changes that can impact the results of potentially what we'll be, what we'll be seeing. So in these first lactation animals, what we're seeing potentially could be important in the, what is the sort of development of these sole ulcers. So again, preliminary results, but it's something that I'm really excited um, to really drill down, to drown it, drill down into and look in, into when we have that sort of full data set um, for sure. Uh, we also have the genetics of these animals. So it will be, uh, we've got some work coming out as again, James has, has mentioned, um, coming out about the hereditary aspect of lameness. Um, super stoked to, to see that, see the live day, because that'll be really, really interesting. Um, and that sort of carving effect that you can see, um, or that, that sort of dip in, uh, of, dip in the fat pad at carving potentially could be a carving effect more than a sort of um, a fat mobilization effect because actually when there isn't some association between body condition score and the um, and the fat pad that we've seen in our study um, so far. Okay, next slide. So yeah, so just this is more this slide's more of a please watch this plate or watch this space, please um, you know come back in a year or two um a year because we'll have so much more information for you uh we've got so much more to include in the final analysis at the moment i'm i'm taking a day off from being in the lab but usually i'm in the lab and i'm currently measuring things like your metabolic profiles and um, so that'll be how well is the cow dealing with the meta metabolic demands uh that's placed upon it during the lactation um to see if there's any differences between those cows that are developing soil ulcers compared to those that aren't and um, so that'll be things like bhvs nephas etc then when you look at um, immune profiles, so your inflammatory um, stuff, so your cytokines, uh, you've got your hormone profiles, relaxing, insulin, etc. Uh, LPS, so whether infection or acidosis, whether that's sort of um, whether that has an impact on the development of soul ulcers. And then we've got your other things like your soul temperature, your foot anatomy, and your and our results from the biopsies. Next slide. Okay, so just sort of a, a bit of a conclusion. Again, um, you know, this is preliminary results, but it's something that we are interested in, inter you know, interested in that these first lactation animals, you know, it's been shown across many studies that they have thinner fat pads in general. Um, and what we've seen in, in sort of our study is that those first, that those first lactation animals that do develop a soil ulcer seem to have a larger drop in the fat pad thickness around calving. So I suppose the takeaway from this is that those animals, those first lactation animals around calving, that might be an, an opportune time 
um, and they may specifically benefit from implementing strategies to mitigate other well-known risk factors in the environment at carving, such as things like poor bedding comfort or bullying, etc. Um, and then just again another um, a sort of plug and another mention that the upcoming work on genetics may also provide um, a lot more information, um, and that's coming from colleagues within my group. Uh, next slide. So just a few um, just a few acknowledge acknowledgements working with the RBC, SRUC, etc. Um, next slide. Perfect. Um, more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Bethany. I think there's already some questions question in the chat for you. Some very interesting findings there already, but still obviously a lot more work to do. But once again, highlighting the importance of managing those cows in first lactation if you want to manage lifetime risk of lameness. And I'm sure there'll be more questions for you at the end. So our next speaker is Chloe Gagan from the University of Nottingham. Chloe is a PhD student working on feed intake and whole farm efficiency. This afternoon, she's going to be presenting to us on how lameness affects milk production and feed efficiency. So thank you very much, Chloe, for joining us today, and I will hand the floor to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chloe, um, and yeah, my presentation will be looking at how lameness could affect milk production and feed efficiency. And next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So lameness has been described as being one of the greatest health and welfare issues facing the dairy industry at the moment. Um, and the implications of lameness extend way beyond um, welfare and can result in reductions in herd productivity and economic performance. Um, few studies have explored the effect of mobility score on feed efficiency of dairy cows, um, but some um, work has found that um, mobility score having a high mobility score um, can affect feed intake and can lower the number of meals a cow is eating per day. Um, and this research that we're undertaking now is looking to understand the effects of mobility in, a, in more detail on dry matter intake and milk yield, which can ultimately provide farmers with um, more opportunities to make clearer decisions um, in regard to animal welfare and feed utilisation on the farm. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the aim of this study was to assess the effect of mobility on milk production and feed efficiency of high yielding dairy cows. So this study was um, done at the University of Nottingham with 55 Holstein Friesian dairy cows. Um, a number of measurements were made, um, including da um, daily feed intake per individual cow, which was measured using electronic automated feed bins um, and milk yield was also measured each time the cow um, went to the milking robot and this also recorded their live weight and the milk was analysed for fat, protein, somatic cell count and urea. Um, next slide please. Um, so the mobility score was assessed weekly by the same observer using the AHDB method um, on a scale of zero to three, with zero being good, one being imperfect, two being impaired, and three being severely impaired. Um, next slide, please. So all of the data um, was collated in Excel and the data was found to be normally distributed. Um, the data was then analysed by using mobility score as a fixed effect and the animal as a random effect in the model. Um, next slide please. So moving on to the results, um, in the next slide you can see um, the number of mobility scores that were given um, and it was shown that most of the cows that were observed had an imperfect mobility score, so a score of one. Um, none were severely impaired um, and there are also quite a, a number of them in, in the good, which, which is a good outcome. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the results on this slide show um, the milk yield and composition. Um, as you can see, milk yield and composition were not significantly affected by mobility score. Um, however, the um, energy corrected milk yield was significantly affected by mobility score with those um, actually being 
of a mobility score of two um, actually having higher milk yields. Um, we also found that cows with, that were of a higher parity number um, were also in a higher mobility score um, category as well. So meaning that older cows were more likely to be lame. And this was a significant outcome. Um, next slide, please. Um, this, so this results page shows the um, effects of mobility on feed intake per each cow. Uh, we found that the cows with a higher mobility score, so being more impaired, had a greater daily feed intake. Um, this was a result that we actually weren't really expecting um, because you would have thought that a cow with a, with a higher mobility score was more likely to be in pain, so wouldn't really want to be getting up to go and feed. Um, but we also found from this research that perhaps there were other factors um, that could have been involved in this, such as age and parity. Um, for example, the older the cow, the more likely she, she is to be high yielding, so would be eating more in general. Um, so obviously that didn't have as big an effect as the mobility score did. Um, the results showed that live weight and feed efficiency were also not affected by mobility score, um, but the individual differences um, show that this is something of interest in what I'm still researching now. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in conclusion, um, the main results from this study were that younger cows with fewer parities were observed to have a good mobility score more frequently than the older cows and these older cows tended to have a greater mobility score and tended to have a greater daily feed intake. The cows observed to have impaired mobility also had the greatest energy corrected milk yield, but mobility score had no effect on feed efficiency. Um, overall, it is, it is still really important um, to prevent the development of lameness um, as it's essential in lowering its impact on animal welfare and treatment costs associated with imperfect and impaired mobility. And I'm hoping to have more data to add to this data set to um, back up what we have found. Um, and that's it. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you for the reminder that questions can be added to the questions box and we will take all questions in the question and answer session at the end. Thank you very much for your presentation, some very interesting findings there. And our next presenter, Amy Gillespie, um, and the team at Liverpool have developed a video on her work on digital dermatitis. Um, and we will be sharing that now and then we will have questions for Amy and all of the other speakers at the end. You will have noticed that the title of this webinar is asserting that digital dermatitis can be controlled and I'm going to focus on some of the aspects that are key to reducing case numbers and case severity. But firstly it's important to note that if your herd is free from DD then it is so important to avoid buying in animals, as this has been identified as the most significant risk for disease introduction. If you must buy in, make sure you inspect all cows' feet and quarantine them in separate housing and implement a preventative foot bathing regime. But bear in mind that even with every effort made, bought in animals are still a risk to a DD free herd because some lesions cannot be seen by eye and some may take weeks to develop to a visible stage. Conversely, some may progress from M0 status, so apparently uninfected, to the chronic M4 status in less than a week and catch you out. It is also thought, although very difficult to prove, that introduction of different species or strains of treponemes may cause outbreaks on farms or increase the severity of an existing disease burden. Once DD is endemic in a herd, our main aim is to reduce transmission between cows. Hygiene in the housing and foot cleanliness is important for this because we know that continual exposure to slurry makes skin more susceptible to DD infection by damaging the protective outer layers. We know from experimental infection models designed to replicate DD that skin damage greatly increases the risk of a foot developing a DD problem. 
It's possible that the bacteria responsible for DD can live in the slurry, but research has not been able to prove this, and so it is currently regarded more as a vehicle for spreading disease rather than as a definitive source of disease. When it comes to optimising housing, many of the measures that we champion for controlling mastitis also apply to the control of digital dermatitis. In fact, when looking critically at your own housing, it may help to think of digital dermatitis as a mastitis of the foot. So let's take a look now at some important aspects of housing for DD control. Here you can see a relatively narrow passageway in cubicle housing where it's possible for slurry to accumulate to harmful depths. Automatic scrapers have to be used here to improve housing hygiene. If you have automatic scrapers on your farm, consider how frequently they're set to run and whether it's enough to prevent slurry buildup. Preventing buildup of slurry is also important in other areas of high cow traffic, most notably the collecting yard and other areas in the vicinity of the milking parlour. Depending on where your heifers are housed in relation to the milking herd and milking parlour, you may need to consider how you scrape these areas to avoid scraping contaminated slurry towards the heifer housing. Wider passageways in cubicle housing, uh, for example 3.6 metres is recommended, will help to prevent slurry from accumulating to harmful depths. Frequent scraping is still required, but as illustrated here, significant slurry contamination is less likely to occur and compromise foot cleanliness. Improving lying times by providing comfortable bedding will also improve foot hygiene, as cows spend less time standing in slurry contaminated areas. Here is an example of deep sand bedding, which is widely regarded as the best system for improving lying times. So I'm going to move on now and talk about some top tips for effective foot bathing, which is an important aspect of digital dermatitis control. There are many considerations in foot bath design, and I would recommend you use the AHDB foot, foot bath fitness test document to reassess your own practices on your farm. The important things to consider are cow flow, where and when are the cows going through the foot bath and can this be done without disrupting milking and without having to drive them through? Does the walking surface provide enough traction for safety but without damaging the feet? What are the foot bath dimensions and therefore the volume? It's very important that the products used are measured correctly each time to ensure the concentration in the foot bath is as intended. Cleanliness is important to ensure the product remains effective as they will not be tested ab above 20 grams per litre of organic matter contamination. I'll illustrate these points in more detail in the video. This foot bath is situated after the parlour exit. It's wide enough for two cows to pass through together, which can be beneficial for cow flow. The grooved concrete walking surface is the same as th throughout the collecting yard and parlour, so is familiar to the cows. The full length is 3.8 metres, which allows each foot to be submerged at least twice as cows walk through. The entry and the exit from the foot bath slopes, making the depth of solution 10 centimetres to the overflow at the deepest point, which is a little short of the 12 centimetres recommended to ensure the skin horn junction is covered, including at the front of the foot. But there is extra depth to prevent excessive loss of solution from splashing. The overall calculated foot bath volume is 600 litres. This farm uses formalin as the foot bathing biocide, which is a popular choice, but it is a known carcinogen and must be handled appropriately according to labelled instructions by a competent person. Here, appropriate personal protective equipment is available and of course it needs to be worn. Formalin is measured in a marked 20 litre closed container, then is added to the foot bath manually. It is possible to install pipes to fill the foot bath directly, which would avoid the risk to farm staff from handling this carcinogen. Um, but it is feasible to have a protocol that includes adequate safety precautions without going to those lengths. 
This video is demonstrating safe measuring of 20 litres of formalin into a closed container. This is then added to the 600 litres of water in the foot bath, giving a 3.3% formalin solution. As I've already said, products used in foot baths are tested to check how effective they are, up to a concentration of 20 grams per litre of organic matter. Beyond this level of manure contamination, it's unknown how effective these products are. Therefore, as a rule of thumb, it's recommended to drain and refill a foot bath after enough cows have been through to amount to one litre per cow of active solution. Refilling is also important because as the solution is used, the depth will decrease and the foot bath will no longer be submerging the entire hoof. Recent surveys have shown that excessive manure contamination and insufficient depth are very common shortcomings with foot bathing regimes, which will impact how effective they are. Let's have a look now at some cows coming through. You can see that cow flow is good. They come through here twice daily every day, so they are very used to this process. I've slowed the video slightly so you can appreciate that each foot gets submerged at least twice and mostly three times. You can also see the depth and how that does reach the skin horn junction despite earlier reservations about the depth. There are 260 cows coming through here twice a day, so in effect 520 cows in total. Therefore, our, our rule of thumb that we stick to at least one litre of solution per cow is easily fulfilled, so we expect the solution would remain effective. Foot bathing of heifers and dry cows is also important and often overlooked. A number of environmental factors thought to influence development of DD during first lactation have been investigated. And the only thing found to make a difference was whether or not heifers had lesions prior to calving or at the time of calving. Remember, lesions can develop very quickly and therefore preventative foot bathing needs to be carried out frequently in these groups. To facilitate this, foot bathing facilities for heifers and dry cows should be integral to the housing. This is an example of a heifer foot bath. The same considerations apply as for foot bath design for cows. This foot bath here is shorter than ideal at just two metres and the depth at least on paper is, uh, is too shallow at eight centimetres. Having said that, if we have a look at some of the heifers coming through, you can see that in this case their feet still do get submerged twice and the skin horn junctions are covered. Hopefully, this video so far has given you a few ideas on how to assess your current housing management and foot bathing regime to improve digital dermatitis control on your farm. I'm now going to talk about hygiene during foot trimming, which is a relatively new area under investigation as a control point for spread of DD. Research has identified lack of hygiene during foot trimming as a risk factor for increased digital dermatitis prevalence in herds. Treponemes have been frequently identified on trimmer gloves and hoof knives, and recent research has shown that treponemes can be cultured from hoof knives after trimming, especially where contact has been made with a DD lesion for treatment. Treponemes can survive on hoof knife blades for at least two hours. A survey of farmers, veterinary surgeons and foot trimmers carried out in 2019 showed that less than half of operators consider hand or hoof knife hygiene during foot trimming. University of Liverpool researchers and AHDB Dairy have developed a hygiene protocol to try to help reduce the spread of DD during foot trimming. This video demonstrates how to use the hygiene protocol. Make sure you're wearing clean gloves and ensure that hoof knives are free from visible dirt prior to foot trimming. Foot knives should be submerged in disinfectant for 20 seconds before use. This cow was seen primarily for treatment of the M4 lesion. So as you can see, there isn't a great deal of tri trimming required.
To treat the lesion, we need to remove the dead scab that is covering it, as we know that the treponemes live a bit deeper down in the skin, and we need our topical treatment spray to come into contact with them directly. We know that treponemes can be cultured from hoof knives after trimming of infected cows in 5% of cases, and where contact has been made with the lesion itself, treponemes can be cultured in 42% of cases. This tells us that hoof knives have very high levels of contamination with treponemes in this setting. To prevent transmission of treponemes to the next foot, clean both your gloves and hoof knives in soapy water to remove visible dirt. Drying knives and gloves with clean paper towel will also help to remove visible dirt. These steps will ensure that the disinfectant remains effective. Return your hoof knives to the disinfectant for at least 20 seconds before the next use. It might be helpful to use alternate pairs of knives for each foot to ensure adequate disinfectant contact time. 2% Vercon, 2% sodium hypochlorite and the iodine-based disinfectant FAM30 used at a 1 in 100 concentration have been shown to be effective for this use. So in summary, this video has hopefully challenged you to think about a number of ways in which you could improve digital dermatitis control on your farm. We've looked at the risks of buying in and how best to mitigate them if this is unavoidable. We've taken a look at housing hygiene and how to avoid slurry buildup, which can be responsible for damaging the foot skin and for spreading the disease. We've covered some tips on how to check and optimise the foot bathing regime. And finally, I've discussed the emerging importance of good hygiene during foot trimming and recommendations for best practice. Thank you for your attention. Roger has a few more messages for us now and then we will be able to take your questions. Some, some good practical advice there on the control of digital dermatitis on dairy farms. I'd now like to invite all the speakers to join us and Shirley McMillan, our HCP Dairy Knowledge Exchange Manager, will um, share some of the questions from the audience um, with the speakers. If there are any other questions, please add them to the questions and we can take advantage of having a, an excellent panel of speakers here today. Thank you very much for all your presentations and over to you, Shirley, for the questions. Yep, sure. Uh, so we'll start with James. Um, first question is that um, other re research appears to suggest that NSAIDs, as in anti-inflammatories, may increase post-carving uterine infections. Did you find this in your study? Um, so within our study, we timed our intervention with anti-inflammatories quite carefully. Um, so there's a range of evidence out there, some of it conflicting, which suggests anti-inflammatory usage immediately postpartum, so immediately after those cows gave birth. Um, would increase the risk of things like retained fecal membranes. So we timed ours to begin 24 hours after they gave birth, or the, near, the nearest milking to that 24 hour window. Um, anecdotally, although we haven't analysed any of that data set yet, so we still have milk and reproductive data to go through, um, anecdotally we saw no effect. And we did several checks with the vet throughout the study period to make sure we weren't having any harmful impacts on the farm. So keep it that 24 hours, that's what I can advocate because that's what we've, we've investigated. Uh, leading on from that then it says is there any value in fresh calved cows in terms of obvious production for uh, sorry was there any other obvious production or fertility and health benefits from group three treatment on heifers yeah so uh, there is some preliminary work I've, I've, it's awful, right? but i can't think of the life of me which group it was for you might i, I can't the university of liverpool was at newcastle um, we've recently done some work on um, carving assistance and administering anti-inflammatory and they've seen positive impacts on production and um, it's on a, a, a slightly smaller data set than what we have here and we hope to be able to delve into that a bit deeper in the future um, but at the moment we're trying to push through the lameness work that was our primary outcome so that's that's really our big focus. A uh, final question for James is what's the best time in lactation to do the therapeutic trim? Yeah, so in terms of preventative work, um, you need to look at your lameness score. Lameness score is king for this. If you notice trends within your, your mobility data set, so let's say your cows are coming lame at 120 days in milk on average, then timing your trim 30 to 40 days before that actually happens could be a really effective way of mitigating that trim. If, if, 
if the cause of lameness by this anthem is cold form disease, if it's digital dermatitis, then you need to look at other interventions. Trying to offer a blanket 90 day trim, if I was to say every plant should do a 90 day trim, they may have issues with thin soles or other challenges like that. So I always say refer to your lameness score, that's key for everything. If you're recording it, make use of it. Thank you. Uh, questions uh, for Bethany. Is there, um, when we're uh, growing heifers to calve younger at 22 to 24 months, does that lead to a thinner fat pad as a milking heifer and beyond? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, we have the ages of those heifers and we have their calving dates, so we can definitely look into those, um, look into that. I mean, there are some evidence to suggest that it's, it is still growing, so potentially there is that role, but um we definitely will be we can definitely look into that with the data set that we have um and it's something that we, we will look into for sure uh, which leads on to the next question about management during the rearing period and um is there any association between heifer nutrition linking it to metabolite and hormone profiles in that rearing period and thinner fat pads and developing sole ulcers in first lactation heifers Oh, the answer to that is definitely watch this space. Um, I'm in the lab at the moment. I'm uh, looking at all those hormone profiles and I'm collecting all that data. So we will have, hopefully, those uh, those results for you. So yeah, definitely watch this space. And I suppose that the other question is, are any of the heifers that you've looked at, were they in a separate first lactation group? Uh, another very good question. Um, yes the uh on two of the two of the farms had separate um heifer lactation groups and then two of the farms didn't um so yeah there maybe that will play into that farm effect potentially i don't know um but yeah there, there was differences between the farms for, for um first lactation groups it would be really nice if we could look at that because all that people yeah. think about is the actual milk yield rather than all the other benefits of keeping them separately on farm thank you and um, questions for Chloe. Um, just to recap, if you had already mentioned this, but are you able to analyse the effect of mobility score on dry matter intake before and after a high mobility score event? Um, yeah, we, we could do. We have the dates when all of the mobility scores were, were taken. So um, we can we can look back on sorry um we can look back on the data that we have from when the cows visited the bin so we can see their daily intake and we can relate that to whether they were whether they were treated or what their mobility score was on that day and see whether it changes um i think it would be better if we could do it after they've been treated if we've noticed that they're lame and then they've been given a treatment either had their like foot trim or a block put on um, and then we can see how their feed intake changes then as well as their milk yield I think that will probably be the better way to to see what the differences are. Uh, the other question was um, were links between mobility score and yield studied within parity groups? Um, we haven't looked I haven't looked within the groups um, but that's something that I, I'm I'm looking at um, but from what we've seen, the, the differences between the parity groups is what really stood out to us because as the cows are getting older, they're becoming more lame, which is obviously what we don't we don't want to happen. And then we've also got the other issue of the cows are coming into the herd lame as well, which is another thing that we don't want. So we want to try and see where the best time for us to really focus on it, it would be. Would you expect the same pattern in a grazing herd? Uh, somebody is imagining that the effect is less in a robot housed herd. Um, maybe. I mean, the thing with that was the measurement of the feed intake would be very would be more difficult to do as you can't. It's not as easy to measure daily intake as it is when they're inside, and we can get a really accurate um, intake measurement. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, some questions with um, oh, for um, Amy. Um, the foot bath design seems to be about cow, cow psychology, trying to get them to go through it. 
and the heifers looked like they were really doing a good job there, not jumping. So what's best? Is it a slope or a step to get to, into the footpath? Um, well, uh, I would go with what the AHDB footpath fitness document says, uh, which is that it is a step. So the, the heifer one on the video is actually um, the setup that would be recommended in that they sort of step over a curb but the bottom of the foot bath where they're landing is then on a level with the rest of the housing so they're not stepping down into anything but they do have to obviously you have to have some sort of curb to contain the foot bath solution um, the other foot bath that was for the adult cows did have a slope on it um, it's it is common to do it that way um, and uh, that you know that it's not wrong to do it like that um as i say that that foot bath fitness document does advocate the curb the curb approach thank you um you were talking about the hygiene around foot trimming tools but how important is the hygiene around the crush itself should people be cleaning up between cows and disinfecting yeah so so part of the argument with um the, the foot trimming tool scenario is that a lot of people say to me, well, what's the point in doing that? Because as soon as I let the cow go, she'll go, uh, you know, through the crush, down the race, through loads of manure uh, that's been left by other cows. And actually, um, what's the point really <laughs> of worrying about your hoof knife? Um, what, I, what I would say is that, um, yes of course as as clean as you can make anywhere and everywhere the cows go at all times the better um because digital dermatitis whichever way um we look at the risk factors hygiene is is, is key um the reason that we pick slightly on the hoof trimming tools is more to do with the fact that we're directly potentially we're directly transferring um the bacteria from foot to foot um, with slurry, it's unclear exactly what the role of slurry is in the transmission of digital dermatitis. Um, it could be, well, it's probably a combination of factors, including um, potentially chain, making changes to the skin on the foot, which makes them more susceptible to, um, to the bacteria. Um, it changes um, if if the cow's feet are very dirty, you're going to have a hard time keeping your foot baths clean enough to be effective. Um, uh, I think I'm going to stop that. I could go on for ages, but I'm not going to go on for ages. Um, so, so hygiene is very, very important in general in the housing um, and, and it should, should be kept as clean as possible. Yeah. Just a final point there, you were talking about buying in, so it's always wise to test and quarantine animals, but it's highly impractical. How about we, how do we deal with this slurry as a reservoir of disease? Yeah, I, I agree. And um, the, the problem with the development of the lesions is that it can happen very quickly or it can actually take a really long time and studies that have looked at the, at the sort of nat nat natural progression of longitudinally of, of lesions in herds show that there's a huge range in progression from healthy to you know having having the lesions um, so even the question of how long you would have to quarantine quarantine them for it is, is a difficult one to answer um, so um, so yeah, I, I agree. I mean, but having said that, if you do have heard that's free of digital dermatitis, you're you're rare as hen's teeth, and you know it, you should be doing whatever you can to to stop it coming in, because once it's there, certainly currently, you know, getting rid of it again is 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 not going to happen um, until we have better solutions for the disease. So um yeah it, it is an it is a big job if you but if your herd is free then then definitely keep it out um a couple of weeks of keeping um animals elsewhere and, and routinely foot bathing them um, would go some way towards preventing from bringing um, from bringing it in
Thank you very yeah. much. There's just a final quick one um, for Bethany about is there a gain in feeding biotin to heifers to help develop the fat pad? I suppose that could relate to any nutrition, but particularly yeah, this one. Yeah, biotin uh, has been definitely some research and it's gone through a phase of, of, of being, uh, it's it's definitely used in the production of, um, of, of healthy horn and I think there's been some research that suggests that it is important, but it's not, I don't think it, it's not the be all and end all uh, that everyone hopes that it is. Um, there's, there was a study that looked at, um, there's, within the fat pad there's quite a few different types of fats um, and the proportions of, of, of different sort of, um, of different types of fats as well has been analysed and they have tried to manipulate the, the composition of the fat pad um, with diet manipulation and, and I can't quite remember, I don't, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I don't believe it was particularly effective. Um, but that was just composition. It didn't. It, it didn't. Uh, I mean, but potentially James might be able to jump in if he can. If he knows exactly. But I don't. I don't. I don't believe it was. Um, it massively increased increased the amount of fat within the fat pad. Um, James. Any... Yeah, there's there's very little in terms of new, um, work on nutritional impacts on fat pad outside of body conditions. Well. Biotin can definitely help with challenges like white line disease. But it's not, it's not a silver bullet, as Beth has already said, um, and it shouldn't be approached as such either. Um, I think you know, there, there is a product to sell there, so I think people being advised should do so with caution and look at other protocols that are put in place to, to mitigate that, for sure. Um, body conditions for lameness is the only association we understand that nutrition has at the moment. There's no laminitis or no bias or the bullet that we can call the trouble on. Thank you. That's that's our questions. All done, Derek. Thank you very much, Shirley. There was one quick question for Amy about the chemical con or disinfecting concentrations for hoof knives. That was for the individual disinfectants, not as a cocktail. It wasn't a mix of disinfectants. The disinfectants oh. you were using for hoof knife concentrations. As in, what, just to clarify what they were. You had put them up three different disinfectant concentrations, but that was each in each disinfectant individually, not a mix of a cocktail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we we trialed. Well, we we started with um, six different disinfectants in laboratory testing, um, and then we took the three uh, that appeared most effective in the laboratory, and we we trialed those on farm. Um, so that and all of them were. Were, were good for what we needed them for. So um, yeah, three separate ones. So Vercon, sodium hypochlorite, and um, FAM30. Thank you very much, Amy. And thank you to all our speakers for excellent presentations this afternoon. I know you only had 10 to 15 minutes, but I realize, I think we all realize that it's the result of years and years of work, not, uh, not just a small amount of work. So we are, grateful to you for all your efforts over the past few years um, and thank you very much for joining us today. We've heard you know, some very interesting and exciting outcomes from that work that you've undertaken um, through the Dairy Research Partnership and which has been funded by Levy Bears. so it's nice to be able to bring those messages back to farmers from James on the importance and potential value of um, anti-inflammatories and from uh, Bethany on the importance of looking after those first lactation heifers, Chloe and the impact of lameness on, um, on milk yield and the further work that she's going to um, do in that area. And finally, from Amy on digital dermatitis and trying to control and prevent that very important disease on dairy farms. So thank you all very much. Thank you to all those farmers who you've worked with as well for um, participating in that research and to all of the research teams at Nottingham and Liverpool for the work, the excellent work that you've carried out um, on behalf of Lily Pears over the last five years. And it's been great to hear about that um, this afternoon. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us. If you have time to complete the feedback survey, we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, you'll see that on screen once the webinar ends. A link to the video will be sent to you within 24 hours and the slides will be made available online. And I'm sure if you have any further questions, please, um, send them to us at ATB and we can um, 
pass them on to the research teams and get answers for you. So thank you very much. And thank you to the team behind the webinar. Apologies for the, for the technical faults which happened and um, great credit to the speakers that they were able to keep going despite all of those technical issues, which appeared mainly to be mine. Thank you very much and goodbye.